So good morning, group. I want to tell you that this is uh, Finance and State Literacy. This is week three of It's Your Estate. And we're going to talk about wills and trusts. And what I'm going to do, if you've been with us the last couple of weeks, I'm going to do a brief introduction now. And then after that, we will begin the actual presentation. And I'll do a little bit more of an introduction. So there's a little bit of a repeat in here for those of you who come in early. But since people trickle in along the way, so I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Hopefully that is up. Yes, it looks it is. Okay, again, as we've, we've discussed, this is the Finance and State Literacy. This is week three of It's Your Estate, and we're gonna talk about wills and trusts. Um, whoop, that didn't work. That did. Okay, this is, year is different than we've done in the past. Normally these are eight weeks long, and this time we're at six weeks. What we've done is taken out some of the duplication along the way, but the other thing we did was to write a workbook. And the workbook is intended to let you follow where the, where the classes are going and write some notes and give some thought. I mean, we'll talk today, we talked last week, we'll talk in the future about who do you want to be responsible for something? How do you want to have these things handled? And they're critical issues to think about. And it's in, during a session, you're busy listening to us and you may not think about those questions. So we encourage you to go through and take a look at those and see what happens. And I wanna go at the moment, I'm going to go live with that and share that screen. So this is the website you can go to and it's the same link that you have for today's material for any of the others. If you hey, go directly- By the way, so you, you can type in IYME.org to shorten it and you'll get this website. Right, yeah. Yeah, the old name was a little bit long. <laughs> yes. Um, so I'm gonna click on on workshops, it's going to think. It's always fun doing live demonstrations to see how quickly something comes up. It's thinking. I think you need to hit it again. No, the little ball is spinning up here at the top. Oh. I agree with you, I'll do it anyway. Mm -hmm. Just to humor me so it'll start spinning again. It might, might be busy. Everyone is logging in and trying to get material out of this. Yeah. <laughs> and so that unfortunately is the only way that I can get there. And we're not going live at the moment. Anyway, yeah. what you can, do, what you can do after you get off of this is to go through, click, and you pick out It's Your Estate. And then you can go through the various weeks. You can see the videos for the weeks we have already done. A week from now, this session will be recorded and will be present. Um, so you can see that one as you go along. I urge you to think about the workbooks and all of that. So I'm going to get out of here. And I'm going to go back over to that presentation so that I can walk us through that one. Okay, so what we have now is looking at the material. So this is the workbook that we talked about. This is what the, the actual workbook itself looks like. That's just a screenshot. And as Pete said, here's the website that you well, can go to. It's the, uh, yeah, you can, you can somebody was saying that they couldn't get into it because of the IYE dot. So just use the IYME and you'll get right to the website. So then you go to the mat, to the original site, which is still spinning, so I won't go back and prove it. Um, so that's where you can get the material. The workbook is there. And as I said a minute ago with Denise, the material for chalk is also there. And Leslie's presentation material, which we'll work through today, is also there, along with her Ask First form. Um, so all of that is available to you. What you can then also do is it will track through the weeks. So today we're at Wills and, and Trusts in terms of where we're going. Next week, it'll be retirement uh, asset planning because that's a critical thing from a financial standpoint for you while you're living and for your heirs after you pass. Then we'll talk about charitable giving opportunities. And the last one is estate administration. So those are the parts we're gonna walk through with this. Um, and so I'm going to stop sharing and bring Pete back. And Pete, what's the organization? What's financial estate literacy? We started financial and estate literacy because it's very difficult for individuals to get good information um, on financial and estate literacy um, because there are so many individuals out there that are selling stuff. And so we made a promise that our mission is yes, just to purely educate. None of our presenters are going to get your contact information. Uh, the only presenters that we use are people that are just selling 
their services and their expertise, but you have to contact them in order to get it. Um, Don, myself, we're always available that we can answer any of your questions. Uh, our program is six weeks long, but we're available for longer than that. The whole point is that you need legal authority in order to make decisions during your lifetime if you have someone else and you can't make them yourself. Also, it's important to distribute your estate. So today we're going to speak with Leslie Daff. Leslie, you would you like to come online? Hi. <laughs> um, Leslie, let me ask, uh, by the way, her ask first form is on our website. And on the ask first form, we talk about and give her a little bit of an introduction, but you can all go on your own and get that ask first form uh, on, on your own. Today, what I like to do is, Leslie, how many years have you been doing um, estate planning? Estate planning, about 21 years. About 21 years. And I'm certain that you're licensed here in the state of California? Yes. And I, I, I believe you're also a certified, is that correct? Yeah, certified specialist. A There's certified a specialist. So you took a second bar exam to get that. Yes. And uh, one of the things that people are always concerned about is how do you charge for your services and I, what do you charge? Okay. I charge a flat fee whenever possible. So almost always. And then I, I, when people call and say, what do you charge? It's so hard to say because it depends how complex it is. So I usually get a feel for it and then I give a flat fee. It can range anywhere from well, with the deed, uh, 1500 all the way to 3000 but it's usually on the lower side. It depends on how complicated it is. And so. Okay. But you will give a quote over the phone if somebody uh, requests what this will cost. You're not offended when somebody says, hey, what are the charges? Oh, not at all. No, okay. but, I, but they have to tell me a little bit about their plan. If it's yeah. seven, five beneficiaries or two or something. Yeah. 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 And, uh, um, and you you handled the deed transfer uh, as part of the estate plan? Yes, and I okay. give instructions on all the funding, which we'll talk about today. Okay, and then uh, uh, in the meantime, phone calls, emails, back and forth, are those extra charges or are those included? It's all free. <laughs> okay, all right, all right. So we've already discussed kind of the overview of estate planning, how important it is to understand title, how important it is to understand cost basis, market value, and your assets. We went through last week, we went through the durable power of attorney and the advanced healthcare directive. So today your focus is going to be on wills and trust. So let's get into the program. Okay, um, now are By the way, Leslie is a very nice person. Uh -huh. You're nice, Peter. <laughs> and incidentally, here's the title slide. So here's her name, contact information, and her phone number and whatnot is at the end of the slides also. But for most of this time, we're just going to talk through this. So Pete, you're going to tell me where you want to go. Okay. Leslie, let's go to the next uh, next slide. Okay. And I'm going to talk about, oh, this is, I get this question all the time about the difference between a will and a trust. But we'll first start with what's the difference between no will and a will. And then I'll also talk about the three different types of wills there are. But anyway, um, if you die without a will at all, and you may have already covered this in prior um, lectures, but the court will appoint an administrator and a guardian for minor children if you need one. And then it will everything will go through probate and we'll explain what that is. And then it will go to your heirs at law, what the, what the state determines will happen. So if you die with a spouse and children, the in spouse and one child go 50 50 you know things like that or well if you have um more children it go one third to the spouse and two thirds of the kids things like that for separate property and all to the spouse for community property so it's all determined by the state um when you have a will and there are three different types of wills um i'll tell you what those are you name your own executor um who administers the estate 
and you can name the, your own guardians or nominate your own guardians for minor children. It will still go through probate though. So it doesn't keep you out of probate. And it goes to, of course, to the beneficiaries you name. So let's talk about the three types of wills there are. One is a holographic will, which is all handwritten. You can write this, uh, the, in law school, we learned of the shortest one was all to wife and it was signed. The, the, the terms of that have to, all the material provisions have to be in your own writing and you have to sign it. You don't even have to date it and it's effective. So you can do your own will. Um, there's also a statutory will, which is a form you can get on this California State Bar website. And it's so you just fill in the blank and there's very detailed instructions on how to do it. And then you could also have one you type right up, you know, or have an attorney draft. Those ones that are written where the material provisions are not in your writing have to be witnessed by two disinterested witnesses, though. So those are the differences there. I don't draft will-based estate plans. If somebody wants to do a will, they can uh, do a statutory will. Or yeah. Something. And so the most common type of will that you do, uh, Leslie, for your clients is what's called the pour-over will. And, oh, yes, yes. And, and why, why okay. is a pour-over will important? Well, let's go to the next. Oh, it's not there. Okay, forget it. Um, so when you have a living trust, and we'll get into that, you have to still have a pour over will because the trust will only work as to assets that are in the trust or titled in the name of the trust or flow into it at death. And so you have to have, in addition, a pour over will, even with the trust. Here, that's, that's the diagram. So the difference between a will and a trust is that when you have a revocable living trust, your assets have to be titled in the name of the trust. It's called funding the trust, which we'll cover, or they'll have to, the beneficiary designation on an asset will name the trust and that's the way they go in. Um, and so, then, so, so if a person has an asset in their own name, uh, uh, Peter Coat, and I die, that asset, if goes through probate, unless it's titled appropriately? Well, there's some intermediate stuff. Yeah, but, but generally. Yes, yes. It goes through probate if it's not in a trust or doesn't flow through a trust at death, generally, okay. with some exceptions. Yeah. So let's go to the next slide, which let's talk about what probate is and why people want to avoid it so badly. Um, and so slide two, um, or three, I mean. So it's the court supervised process of distributing someone's assets after death when they're titled in their sole name and there's no beneficiary name, let's say, or no trust. Um, so the why people try to avoid it so much is because the fees are exorbitant, you know, so um, so and, and they're based on the gross value of the estate. And let's get some terminology here because you'll hear all these terms. I'm going to try to get all the terminology straight on all these things administrator is the person who administers your estate when there's no will. Um, executor is when you name somebody in a will and personal representative encompasses both. You can call them all those things. Um, let's look at the probate fees on the next schedule. This is why people are trying to avoid it so much. Uh, this is this from the California probate code. Um, so when somebody tells me they have a million dollar house, even if they owe a million dollars on it and it's going through probate, my fee as an attorney is going to be $23,000. Um, and then it's it's 10,000 up from all that. So if you go, then you go 2 million, it's gonna be 33, you know, it's gonna be another 10,000 each time. Um, there's also court costs, about 1,500 in court costs for a probate, you know, we find and filing fees. Probate referee fees are 1% of the assets being valued. Um, you could bond on a million dollar stays about $2,800 with good credit. Um, that's annual. It's taking about 18 months or more to get these uh, probates through. Uh, through. With the pandemic, it's good. it's taken a little even longer than that. I know it's taken up to two years, even longer. Yeah. We have probates in six counties and it's taking over half my practice right now. I have so many probates going on. Um, so yeah. There, because people are not doing, well, most people don't do living trusts. Um, anyway, so then um, everything's public too. So people look at the records and call me all the time. Are you selling the property? Things like that, because it's public record. And then, but you know, sometimes there's, if it's a very complex or litigated estate, I mean, it's, it might be better to have it in probate and have court oversight. So, you know, there's not, it's not all bad all the time, but it is very time consuming and very costly. Um, so we try to avoid it for the most part. So how do you avoid it? I think you talked about this in a prior workshop, but let's talk about it again. Pay on death. If you put pay on death or transfer on death designations on bank accounts, you can, it'll avoid probate. Beneficiary designations, if you name a beneficiaries on retirement accounts and life insurance. 
a lot of people do um, do-it-yourself estate planning, put their kid on title while they're living and don't want to do a trust, but there's some drawbacks because it's a gift and it doesn't, you don't pay gift tax unless you go over your exemption, but um, you know, you put your kid on the title and they get divorced or they get in a car accident, you know, you're putting your house at risk and then you, they don't get the stepped up basis. They would inherit when they inherit at death instead. So revocal living trust at the bottom is our favorite method of avoiding probate because these other, these other ways are kind of static. When you put a pay on death designation and people die, you know, you have to make sure, and let's say you're incapacitated and you can't change them. That worries us where trusts always have backup, backup, backup. It's just the, the best thing to do. I like revocal living trust based estate plan. Yeah, and it's a title. I, yeah. how, if somebody asks you how you should have title to your assets, you should have it in a revocable trust. That's right. That's right. That's right. Um, so anyway, when you have a trust, um, you you know you uh, are the grantor. When you when you set it up, you we call the person who sets it up whose assets are in there the grantor, the trustor, the settlor, the trust maker. And they all mean that basically the same thing. Is that it's correct? The same thing. It's the person who puts the stuff into the trust. And then the trustee is the person who manages the assets, and that's going to be the grantor initially. The person who put the assets in the trust is the trustee who's managing. And then, then that person is also the beneficiary during his, his or her lifetime. And then the, the trustees will change over time as that person becomes incapacitated or die. The, new, the successor trustees steps in and then at death the the assets pass to the beneficiaries the grantor named i use grantor because i explained to clients that the grantor grants assets to the trust i just use that um so that's what i my favorite way of calling it um so let's talk about um oh yeah my diagram i use this every time i meet with a client because I, I draw all over it. This is a this is a basic estate plan. How it all comes together. There's incapacity. The documents that that work on incapacity and the documents that work at death and the trust is in the very center because it works at incapacity and death. So in a perfect world, a perfect estate plan as a, as a basic estate plan is the revocable living trust, which is you can think of as a contract between the grantor. Um, who puts his, the assets in the trust and the trustee who manages the assets and they name successor trustees to step in at incapacity and death. Um, if something is not in the trust, um, the trustee cannot manage it. So that's why we have to have the power of attorney. That's how it's related. The power of attorney is there for, for the trustee to, to, for the same people named as trustee, named in the power of attorney to handle things um, if it's not in the trust during the, the grantor's lifetime because powers of attorney die when the grantor dies or the principal. I just want to re-emphasize the importance of please understand how you hold title to your assets because is do people when you come into their off in into your office uh and they say hello I have uh, own a house and do they know how they have title to that house typically not no yeah I find that really true as well. And, and, and usually they, they think that it's maybe in the trust, but usually it's in their own name or it's in joint tenancy. Oh yeah. And what's, we always pull the deed, even when they tell me it's in the trust, cause we find it's not, you know, a lot of times they'll have refinanced and it, it, it's taken out. It's not in yeah. the trust. Yeah. People so. are very confused on title. And so, but you want title. It's so important because even if you, um, if somebody names me as their trustee, and then I find out that all of their assets are not in the trust, then I am managing nothing. Yeah, yeah. You know, so it's really important to understand that. Those right. questions have come up. Um, this is a lot of steps. I have a really small estate. Let's say for the sake of discussion, it's only $150,000 so that I stay under the 166,000 something probate rule. Do I need all this stuff? Do you well, own real me, estate is what I would ask. Yeah, if you own real estate, we, we usually always do a trust. Um, I mean, I did a, I instructed somebody how to do everything yesterday who's, she's terminally ill and had to, has an estate under, well, actually they changed that on April 1st, Don, they moved <laughs> that up to 180. 184 or 5, inflation 000. okay yeah that 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 base so if you're under 184 uh 500 
in aggregate, you can avoid probate with a small estate affidavit instead. Um, I think you can, I mean, I, I tend to only do or advise on will-based estate plans if somebody's terminally ill. I don't, I just don't like will-based estate plans because it's, or, or, or beneficiary designations, it's just too static and, and I don't know, I just, I, that's my preference. Well, and one of the important things, and it's now gone all the way up to 180 something thousand dollars, recognize that probate is gross value, not it net. Is. So if I own a $500,000 house and I have a $400,000 mortgage, it isn't 100,000, it's 500,000. Correct. For probate, right. it's 500,000. Yes, so that's yes. another way, especially when you get into real estate or something else, it's the gross value, not the lead of loans and documents and all the other kinds of things against that. Yes. What kinds of assets wouldn't you put into a trust or do you wanna get into that later? Well, I get into it later, but I can, I, I'll tell you that it's life insurance, uh, retirement accounts and, uh, annuities they are not i mean they're in they remain in your sole name during your lifetime you can name the trust the beneficiary but definitely want the advice of an attorney when, with regard to retirement accounts but yeah they can be they they can be the trust can be named the beneficiary okay um want to go me, back to, to the outline i want to go back to that diagram for just a moment just to see how everything interrelates so you will name but the trustees will be named in your revocable living trust will be the same people you name on your power of attorney because they act under different document depending on whether it's in the trust or not that's that's important during your lifetime um then at, at death if something is not in your trust at death then we're going to go to court on a petition to try to get it in if you have a trust and if that fails then we'll use the pour over will which will pour it into your trust after a full probate so it's an emergency um, document. It's an emergency. People think like I have a poor will. I don't have to worry about funding my trust or getting things in my trust. That's that's a fallacy. You don't want to ever use the will. And we have never used the will personally. Yeah. I want to keep the terminology straight too, because people get very confused. They always call their trustee the executor, this and that. Um, the the poor of will, the will, the executor, that's called the executor or personal representative. If it's a poor of will and the guardian is named in that document for minor children, but the trust is the trustee is the person in charge. Um, and then the power of attorney is an agent or attorney in fact. So there's all these different terms that people get confused about, but that's how they're all laid out there. For people. Why are trust a hundred pages long? To cover any possibility. I mean, okay. <laughs> it's crazy. And then we even like cover kidnapping and, you know. So and to, and, and to that point, does a lawyer have a responsibility of recommending a trust if they're doing an estate plan or? It's one of the things they talk about, but they do they have a, a I'm going to call it a legal responsibility to have said, incidentally, you should think about a trust. I think so. I think, I mean, it's the, you've got to tell people what the best, that's the best plan for, for anybody. Yeah. Well, that's, okay. again, I think, Don, to that question, I think it becomes really important to go to someone who does estate planning exclusively. As somebody well, who, the, the question uh, isn't what should they, it's a question that they have a legal obligation to do it. I mean, you're yeah. right, they should do it. Yeah. But on the other hand, have you have the right to say, no, thank you. But on the yeah. other hand, is it a legal responsibility? Can I go back and sue them because they didn't do a trust for someone? Mm. I don't yeah. know about that. Yeah. I don't know, can you sue a lawyer? Yeah, yeah, I'm kidding, I'm kidding, can, I'm but... kidding. <laughs> uh, by the way, uh, one of the most common questions that I always get is, is that how should I title my car? Okay. And uh, uh, Leslie, what, what about cars? I actually don't. You can. You can put it in the trust. It's a huge hassle. Um, so you can. I usually say, you know, cars don't go through probate. You could have a $200,000 car. It's not going to go through probate. You can transfer the DMV with a small form, a certificate of title, and a death certificate 40 yeah. days after death. Yeah. So I think that's easier than titling it in the trust. Yeah. So we, we tend yeah, to Cars it. do not put the name of the car in, or registered in the name of the trust. Uh, do or... Joe or Mary Smith. That way you don't even have to do anything after the first death. Uh, the two most important things about the living trust. One is who are you going to name as a trustee after you are you suffer from some sort of incapacity? And the second part is going to be it distributes your estate. Right. So talk a little bit about both. Oh, okay. Well, I was, I will go there. Um, 
So naming trustees is very important. You need to, you know, people get stuck on this all the time. Friend, family member, CPA, private fiduciary, corporate it, trustee. Incidentally, if you know you're going to talk about it later and it flows with the uh, documents, yeah, then we can tell later. Pete that we're going to hold off on that question yeah. and come to it later. Let me tell you a question then people ask me all the time. This is slide 10. Do I need a revocable trust or an irrevocable trust? Well, you need a revocable living trust as the centerpiece of your plan. The irrevocable trust is one you create if you have like too large of an estate, you want to get things out of your state, you gift assets away and that you don't own those anymore. So people then once they hear that, they say, oh, I don't want an irrevocable trust. You no longer own the assets. Uh, revocable trusts do become irrevocable at the death of a grantor, though, uh, at the death um, of someone. Um, now, ir irrevocable trusts, even though they say they are irrevocable, they actually are revocable under some circumstances. Um, first of all, a revocable living trust can be changed during the grantor's entire lifetime, of course, by the grantor. But an irrevocable trust, even after death of a grantor, can be changed. I'm in court all the time on petitions um, where we're changing or interpreting things. So um, if all, even after death, if the beneficiaries all agree, um, you can, you, and there's changed circumstances that led to a desire to change it, we can do that. We, we've been successful every single time so far. Um, the thing about an irrevocable trust also, if you, like some people create gifting trust, they gift uh, assets to a trust for their children, things. You will have always file a 1041 tax return every year, a fiduciary income tax return. I, whenever I create a, a, a irrevocable trust, like a special needs trust standalone, I will always put a trust protector in there because you're not supposed to be able to change it. So we want a trust protector in there who can protect the trust and make changes as needed. Um, irrevocable trusts get have hit the highest um, rate of tax at $13,451 of income versus if you were a single taxpayer, like 650,000. So you need to, that's a consideration you want to you want to distribute the income so it's taxed in the beneficiary's rate, not in the tax rate, in the irrevocable trust tax rate. Okay, so that's something to keep in mind. Um, but anyway, the 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 re revocable living trust is the one that you're really calling my office about. You want to set that up. You want to uh, it avoids conservatorship and probate. Um, if you become incapacitated, somebody steps in and handle things for you. Um, everything's private that's good and bad because if you have a bad trustee and they don't know you don't know what's happening but um typically if you have if you get the right trustee it'll be fine um the drawbacks of a revocable living trust um of course it costs money um to set up but um i think it's well worth it and um then you have to have it reviewed on a regular basis because yeah. a, a will is not effective until your death when yeah. does the trust become effective? Immediately, the fund signing. Yeah. yeah. So um, I get a couple questions about this all the time also. Like I need to set up a trust for asset protection. A revocable living trust does not provide any asset protection whatsoever. In fact, California is a very <laughs> creditor friendly state. There's very little asset protection in California. Um, and then the other one I get all the time is um, what's the tax ID number of my trust? I get that call all the time from the bank. What's the tax ID number? It's your own social security number. Nothing changes when you have a trust, except now you're kind of trusty. Um, but everything else is, remains the same. So it's not, there's no separate entity. It's you still. Now, um, the most important thing, I see this a lot. When people do, do the do-it-yourself estate plans or maybe budget plans, they don't get their assets in the trust. Maybe they'll get their house in the trust, but then everything else is just a mess. It's nothing. You're, you're you're talking about funding the trust. Now let's talk about funding the trust, which is a critical step. Yes, it means. When people say, "What does funding mean?" It means you're going to take your assets as a overarching idea. You're going to take all your assets and retitle them from your name as an individual to your name as trustee of the trust. That lets your trustee manage them during your incapacity and distribute them at your death. Um, and people always call me about this too, or often, like I bought a new house, I got to change my trust. No, 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 you don't have to change your trust. You just take title in the name of the trust. It doesn't change the terms of your trust, doesn't change your trustees or beneficiaries at all. So um, it's very important to get assets in the trust. Now there's some exceptions like life insurance and retirement accounts. Like I said, always stay in your individual name. They cannot be a trust asset during life. Um, so, um, so that's on the next slide. Um, 
that you can name you can name beneficiaries and those avoid probate or you can name the trust but again be very careful about you'll have this in your next session about retirement plans so i won't talk about it now but yeah um, we'll we'll go through that but it's you know in the workbook it has a whole section in there encouraging you to list all of your assets and then after each asset put in the title of your asset i recommend getting a photocopy of the deed just to make sure and it you know keep it with your estate plan so that you have the title correct then you have the cost basis the reason why you want your cost basis is that if you sell that asset, you're going to pay a capital gains tax based on the market value. And so having cost basis of market value is a is a is a is a kind of a way for you to also to keep track of your net worth. So, uh, when we, so when we talk about assets, there's a couple of questions. Is my cemetery plot supposed to be retitled to the trust? I have retitled those. Yes, definitely. It's okay. a property asset. It's a property asset. Uh, we had discussed 706 forms. You, you mean a state or, tax return? Yes. Or are we going to leave that for administration on the sixth week? I was going to well, touch on them briefly. Yes. Okay. If I have a beneficiary designation on an asset, but the assets listed in my trust, when I die, does the trust get it or the beneficiary? The answer is the beneficiary. That's an excellent question. Yeah. So a lot of pe times people will like leave a house to somebody in their trust, but it's title is joint tenants with somebody else, or they'll have a, like, I want this bank account to go here and, right. and, they, and they have a beneficiary designation. The, that's going to trump. Yeah. All the, the titling and the beneficiary designation will trump the trust. Yeah. So title trumps. Yeah. You got to really coordinate this plan. That's where people really fail is coordinating. Yeah. We had a, a professor at Long Beach State University who uh, named his wife of two weeks uh, on the forms when uh, with the eight human resources department. And he lived with another woman for another 35 years. Guess who got all of the retirement funds? Yeah. The wife of two weeks. Yeah. Yeah. So there's an interesting question. I don't have a will or a trust for the sake of discussion, so I'm going to be intestate. It's going to follow the rules of the state. There's a wife and two children. One of the children has basically been out of the out of the uh, estranged for ten years. Are they going to get an equal share to the other child? Intestate. Yes. yes. Right. Which is a good reason why you should have a will and a trust, <laughs> or at least a will, uh, because yes, a child's a child. Yeah. It doesn't say estranged or not, or bad child or good child. It says any kid gets it. Yeah. Okay. And again, like, yeah, the community property would all go to the spouse in, in that case. And then uh, all the separate property would go to a one third to the wife and two thirds to the two kids. Yeah, that's how it would work. Do you have another question or? I, I'm, I'm just reading them. I'm sorry. Uh, we'll come back to them. Okay. So, all right. Go ahead. Um, let's talk about, let's go. Let's just, I, I'll just talk about life insurance. Uh, life insurance, I typically name the trust the beneficiary because then it will go um, according to the terms of the trust and there's backup beneficiaries. I have, I'm in probate right now on one where the client, they, the, pair, the people died two, uh, five days apart. Husband died, wife was the name, the beneficiary of the, the, the life insurance. And then she died five days later, but she had vested in it. So now it's going through probate. So um, yeah, we, we like to name the trust, typically, unless you have a creditor problem, then you want, want to name beneficiaries directly, it goes right to them. Um, anyways, because there's one, creditors can come after a trust for a year after death, but anyway. Let's go into the, the funding the trust item by item of the real property. This is where people really uh, are lax, I think. And so what real page property. are you on on the outline? So uh, can, uh, there you go. Okay, so real property. Good job, Don. <laughs> if you're a sole owner or a, tenant or a tenant in common owner, you can transfer your interest to the trust. And that's the deed and preliminary change of ownership report recorded. If it's joint tenancy, you have to sever the joint tenancy and that can cause a property tax reassessment. Be careful. And then you, you, you transmute it to a tenant in common interest and transfer it to your trust. 
um, the timeshare interests are either transferred by deed or points-based ownership. So you either do a deed and record it, they're really long deeds, usually with huge long legal descriptions, or if it's point-based, you just deal with the timeshare company and they charge the same as an attorney charges for deed actually though. Um, if it's a co-op in like Laguna Woods or something, we have to provide an attorney letter and they will, will reissue the co-op certificate in the name of the trust. This is important if somebody has out of state real property, it's even more important for them to have a trust because they have not only avoided probate in California, but they uh, avoid an ancillary probate in another state. So I had a client who died with property in all these states. It, it was a probate and we had probate in Florida and one other state, I don't remember, and also here. So we wanna avoid that. Um, the next one, bank and brokerage accounts. Uh, as a general rule, all bank and brokerage accounts should be retitled in your name or names as trustees of the trust. And it's really easy to do that. All you have to do is take your trust document to your broker. Except I find this one problem from time to time. They'll say they'll, the banks or the bro or brokerages or the credit union will say, oh, we'll just name your trust the pay on death beneficiary. I don't want that. I mean, I want they, because it's just easier paperwork. Um, I want it to be in the name of the tr in the near names as trustee so the successor trustee can step in it in capacity. If you put it on a pay, if you put the trust the pay on death beneficiary, then they only get to access it at death. I don't want that. So I, you have to be real strict with the uh, bank and say, I want it a title to be in the name of the trustee. I don't want to pay on death beneficiary, but yeah. I do. And so a lot of times they just want the cover page, the name of the trustee and the signature page. Correct, correct, yeah. You're, su you're supposed to be able to use a certification of trust, but banks do want to see that successor trustee lineup, even though you could change it tomorrow, but they still want to see it, it makes them, gives them comfort, I guess. Um, Sometimes a, a married couple will have separate bank accounts. They don't want their spouse on them, but they have a joint trust. So in that case, I'll say, as long as it's not a huge amount, I'll say, yeah, go ahead and keep it in your sole name and name the trust, the beneficiary or whatever, but they'll want to keep it out of the trust for some reason. Um, now, sometimes the older clients, elderly clients want to name a co-trustee only as to one bank account. Like, oh, people want to leave their household checking account out of the trust. I, I still like it in the trust. And they, I'd rather them name their child as a co-trustee. We can give them the paperwork and the child can access that and everything. Because if you put your child on title, this is one thing I see a lot. People will put one child, the child that's near them on title um, so they can access it for them. But then it all goes to that child. It doesn't go according to the terms of the trust. And that's so it kind of messes it up. I'd rather them name the child co-trustee. Um, and you can give somebody a power of attorney over a trust account as well. Um, so that's it. You don't, people think they have to change the names on their checks, but they don't have to. They shouldn't have to change the names on their checks to reflect the trust name. Here's another place where people leave. Let, let, me, let me stop you for just a minute. Um, but if I put my house in the in the trust and I refinance the house. Mm -hmm. The lender often takes it out of the name of the trust. And then I, yeah, we had to go to court on these. Uh, they leave it out of the trust and they die. And yeah, we go to court on a petition and say, we they meant for it to be in the trust. Can we get so it in with them? The important part is once you finish the refinancing, you need to bring it back in. Your bank isn't gonna do it for you. You need to have it retitled back into the trust. They should you do need it. to be alive. You have to be, yeah, you have to be a real aware of that. Yeah, because yes. yeah, yeah, so very or, important. Yeah. Or if you uh purchase a, a vacation property, or you know, uh, uh if there's a change in your life, a style, your trustee moves away, or you know, the change circumstances, you need to change your trust. Correct, correct, yeah. I agree. On um, the on the um, slides, there was a Hegstead petition. Yeah, I have that coming up. Oh, it's yeah. coming up. Okay, I'm sorry. Yeah. I, to, I, I wasn't reading ahead because I can't do that. Um, <laughs> under estate, estate, I die without a, a will. What is That's a stepchild? What is a stepchild as opposed to an adopted child? Is there a distinction? Is a child the child as a stepchild? I don't know what the definition of a stepchild is. I I, I married my wife. She had a child, and I die. She dies. Is the stepchild no, my no, child? No, you have to uh, have adopted them, but for or uh, or but for or you you have to have either adopted them or you have to have tried but couldn't because of a legal barrier. 
you know, and that's that. Those are the only exceptions to stepchild. It's your it's your bloodline. And it would be easier if you did a will, because now you've named them. We've gotten away from the state's rules to say this is what I want done. Yeah, or you name it in the trust as well. Yeah, remember the trust. Right? The trust right. is you, a distribution instrument as well. Regardless, so regardless of the family relationship. <laughs> yes. You're saying, Don, they want the stepchild to inherit. Is that what they want? Oh, yeah, they would have to say that. Yeah. Right. Otherwise, they would not by intestate. No, right. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. That's right. Um, okay. So anyway, business interests, interest in sole proprietorships, corporations, professional corporate. Oh, professional corporations, limited liabilities, et cetera. We assign that. We do a one-page assignment assigning the stock or the membership interest to the trust. You're supposed to change title and books and records. Um, you do not change title in your business bank accounts. You leave it in the trust. You leave it in the name of the business by virtue of assigning it to the trust. It's in the trust. How about personal property? Do I put uh, my name on all my couches and <laughs> yeah. woodwork? How do I? How how do people know that what personal property? is in my trust. Well, we just do, again, a one-page assignment of all your stuff. And then if you want a particular item to go to a particular person, our trusts say that you can put it on a personal property memorandum. So this goes there, this goes there, yeah. So and personal can... property then would not be named individually in the trust. No, you don't need to. Unless, so I have people who want to and they can, but, <laughs> but, but uh, there's no- Not it's, recommended. It's not, it doesn't, a piece, it, it doesn't hold title in any manner. So no, yeah, yeah it's if, fine. If we go back to property, if something was held in joint tenancy with someone else, can I put my part of the joint tenancy in the trust? Yes, if you sever the joint tenancy. So on the deed, we say, you know, you're severing, you're transferring to the trust, you're severing the joint tenancy. And then, so it becomes a tenant in common interest, a tenant, your 50% tenant in common interest can go into your trust. But when you sever a joint tenancy, it will, it can be cause a reassessment on property tax. Right. That's a huge issue. Yeah. Please see legal counsel before <laughs> you do that. Right. Oh, if people do deeds by themselves, I really, I. Uh, um, never. So well, that's never. a normal part. When you go through and do a, you know, a will and trust for someone, you will handle the titling of the house. Oh, yeah. And and critical pieces like that. The bank account, you can change your own. But title, title, title. title. Pete's, it is Pete's so litany. Yes. important. Okay. It's so okay. important. I usually give people a to-do list of, you know, go to the bank and change this into your name as trustee of the trust, you know, change your beneficiary designation like that. Um, safe deposit box. So, I mean, I know clients have gone over and retitled them in the name of the trust, but, you know, you just want to have an, a way to have it accessed. Um, By the way, is... Uh, do people need, why, why would somebody need a safety deposit box today? I, I usually know. find <laughs> old paper. <laughs> in there. I have, you know, stocks are now electronic. Uh, title is electronic. Yes. Um, gold coins, maybe, right? That maybe. Yeah. Jewelry and coins. But yeah. 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 That's what Rethink it's. the idea of safety deposit boxes. Yeah. yeah. Uh, true. Promissory <laughs> notes. Ah, yeah. big issue. Yeah, we assign that to the trust as well. Uh, paper savings bonds, you can retitle those in the name of the trust. What you if you lend money to one of your kids? And what does a trustee have to do if, uh, if you have a note now assigned to the trustee? Well, you can collect, collect the promissory note you should collect on when someone passes. Uh, well, it depends you, what the terms are, I guess. It depends on, if, you know, what is your experience with those? Have you had problems? Horrible. <laughs> uh, you know, mom promised me that if she died and I hadn't paid it back, that she would forgive the loan. Interesting. So I have what I do for people. I do an advancement schedule for people who have lent money to the children and the and they're they can update it as they pay it off and things like that. And then that goes against their share when they die. So we have ways of handling loans to kids or advancements, but yeah. yeah. Anyway. The other problem I see a lot of times is the one of the kids are with mom or dad when they're in their nineties and they're starting to use mom and dad's credit card, car, spending a lot of their money and the other kids don't know what to do. Um, and mom thinks that, or dad thinks that, uh, hey, um, 
the one child who's living with me is not doing anything wrong. Yeah. So, you know, it's uh, you get into the whole issue of um, financial abuse. Yeah, that happens a lot too, but uh, it's tricky because usually there's one child that steps up and some, you know, yeah, it's, it's a tricky issue. Yeah, it, it, there's no easy solution, but if you are uh, the child that's outside and you see this going on, recommend highly that you see an attorney yeah. and discuss it. Elder abuse and yeah. financial elder abuse. Definitely. Yeah, paper saving bonds. Those can be transferred into the, the name of the trust. Um, you Like we talked about cars, we don't really put them in the trust. No. Uh, it's a Coast Guard vessel that's we can we can, you can use a transfer of ownership form we've done it it's kind of a hassle that we've done those mobile homes are a big hassle but you can transfer them into the name uh of the trust of course your name is trustee of the trust and like, like i said we we can get tangible personal property in the trust with an assignment as well so yeah. um let's talk one, about this is oh go ahead well one of the things i recommend is this is that by making the trustee the final arbitrator of your personal property distribution Yes, we always do that because we don't want fighting over this stuff. So we have the, the trustee can make the final decision and it's un, you can't challenge it. Um, so then this is a really important slide, I think, because, well, first of all, let's say assets are not in the trust. Let's say that you did refinance, you go into a coma, whatever, your, tr your agent can transfer it into the trust. If they can, before you die, they can get things in the trust before you die, signing your name. Um, a small estate affidavit that changed from you know 166,250 up to 184.5 as of uh, April 1st. So you can, if you have in aggregate assets under that amount, uh, you can just use it. What's called a small estate affidavit. It's a one pager. Um, I, we go to court on these, you know, from time to time. A Hegstad Ukestad petition. What that is is if you have a trust and something is not in the trust at your death. We can go to court and say, you know, we you they meant for it to be in the trust. You lay out your case. Um, if it's uh, listed on a schedule at the back of your trust, that's a classic Hegstad petition. It was on the, we listed your house on the back of the trust. You refinanced it. You didn't put it back in. Can we get it in without a probate? The court will say yes. It's a seven month, six seven month process. You know, it's not free. It's several thousand dollars. So it's, you want to avoid it. But Ukestad is a case where we have also gotten it in when, when there's a general assignment, which we embed in our trust saying that you intended for all current and future assets to be in the trust. So we rely on that. Yeah. One time most, I, most court appearances are between 3000 to $10,000, you know, because the attorney has to process the paperwork there, there's some court costs. There's usually always follow up. And so it is expensive. Yeah, the hopefully the, the, the whole idea of having a living trust is just that to avoid the court involvement and yeah. their expense. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. We've always been successful, but uh, it's the, it's a house. It's cost money and it's time consuming. Everything in court's time consuming. And then, of course, the pour over will. Do not rely on the pour over will. We never want to use the will. It's just the final safety net to pour it into the terms of the trust. If it's, it's so they can be distributed according to the terms of the trust. If everything else fails, we never have used a will personally because we've never failed that badly. <laughs> so anyway, so that's how it works. So um, just and I know Pete, this will be discussed more in in week six, but I just want to touch on it now. Okay, I'm the sole heir. There's no other family members. There's nothing else going on. I wind up in probate. Why do I have to notify creditors and all kinds of other people? There is no debt. There's nothing. Why can't I just avoid all of this? I don't want to deal with it. It's just the law. And you know, you don't even have to notify creditors because you still the minute those letters are issued, your letters testamentary putting you in charge, you have to wait set four months for creditors to because you publish notice and you have to wait four months whether you notify them or not. That's the court, that's just the way it is. So um yeah, that's why that's why it's so time consuming because you have, you know, you have to get the letters, you have to wait for that, you have to get the inventory to the appraiser, the probate referee, it's all appraised, you have to wait for the court hearings, you know, it's really time consuming. But I need the money. <laughs> <laughs> Do a will and a trust. <laughs> yeah. The trust now, will help you avoid I've some of that. I've had telephone calls. Or pay on death. 
Yeah, well, I have had telephone calls from beneficiaries saying, "Is my parents deceased yet?" Because uh, <laughs> I need to uh, need to pay my mortgage, a new car. Yeah, oh. Oh. yeah. So, you know, money is just so. Um, what happens when someone dies? A lot of times, uh, I know I'm just going to say the children, 60, 70, and 80 years old, a lot of times, resent something that happened in early childhood. And now all of a sudden, there isn't a parent there to act as the referee, and the fight starts. So, you know, and that's kind of what um, your attorney. Hopefully, if you explain your family members and how they are behaving, they can help prevent the family disharmony upon your death. Another question is, incidentally, why do I why don't I do transfer on death of all of my assets and just avoid all this stuff? Yeah, I know. I, I like I said, I told this woman yesterday who's terminally ill. She's you know, she's going to do that. The reason I don't like it is because life can change. And you, we always think of like, what's the worst case scenario? The worst case scenario is you name these people and then you, you're in a coma for five years and life changed, they've died and then it's going to go on probate. I just, I just, it's, it's too static for me personally. Um, I don't mind a few here and there. And at least if it's under 184,500 in aggregate, but you know, I just don't, it's not my favorite thing. I mean, it's, it, it prevents you from having any kind of flexibility whatsoever. But not only that, you know, you want to have those funds of it. Let's say you're in that coma for five years. You want your successor trustee to step in and manage those assets and pay for your medical bills and your assisted living and all that stuff. And when it's a, a transfer on death, it's not going to be transferred till death. I mean, you want to make it easy. Now, powers of attorney can work, but, you know, they don't like banks don't like powers of attorney they like their own form you go i told the woman yesterday go to the bank where you have your accounts and get use their power of attorney form and maybe they won't argue with that but you know you could i mean you could be stuck in their legal department for a long time and one of the interesting parts of all of these as we go through these over over the time you know we, we talk about advanced healthcare directives and power of attorney while you're alive and by implication we're saying wills and trusts are after you die no no, not at all. They do, <laughs> but along the way, I need to be able, how do I deal with these assets and how do I deal with what's going on? If you walk into that bank with a copy of the trust that said, this is in the trust, therefore as trustee, this is what I can do. A Different. lot easier to work with a trust yes. than our attorney. Yes. For sure. yeah. okay. And the thing of it is, is, is that usually when there is a crisis in the family and you need to switch hats, the wonderful thing about a trust is, is that all you need that resignation letter and boom, the new trustee steps right in and can get access to money to resolve some of the issues that are going on immediately. So it's, Leslie, out of curiosity, what, is, what kinds of information do I need to create a trust? <laughs> yeah, now this is even this is even just the name is important. I'm serious because people always put their whole name on the worksheets. Um, you know, John Lewis Smith and Julia, you know, whatever Smith. And then they want to name the trustee, the John Smith. They want to make this really long thing. But, you know, use the name you're going to most often use on titles of accounts, like your first middle initial and last name. You could always add also known as is in your trust, but use the name you typically sign and most financial institutions like this format for and then the the name of the trust they always think well i'm gonna i want asset protection i'm not going to have my name in the trust well it doesn't matter if your name is in the trust or not because your name as trustee will show up on assets there's three components your name as trustee the name of the trust and the date of the trust and you don't have to have your whole name as trustees and the whole all your names again for the trust and then the date of the trust make it shorter and um, simple i think um People, I think it's all sensitive information, but I don't ask for social security numbers and account numbers. That's really for you to know, not me. Um, and then uh, successor trustees, this is what Pete asked about early on, like who are you to name? This is very, very important to handle your financial affairs of planning capacity and death and who's going to handle things um, after you die, distribute them. Yeah. Uh, and it changes. Yeah, so then, so interestingly, 
people sometimes their kids are 15 or 20 or something and they're too young but to a, the biggest change i see down the line is when you have 15 year old children and then you'll come back 10 years from then and change and make the kids trustee sometimes we'll just draft it where when the kid is trustee um, 25 he goes to the top behind the spouse and then they only have to take him down if he's gone sideways but so we'll draft ahead of time to expect the best and things like that um and then you have to decide i'm sure peter does not like joint people acting jointly or by majority or by unanimous but people have to decide do they serve individually in order that's the cleanest and best um sometimes they want to have their kids serve jointly or by majority or five people but unanimously or something but it's difficult jointly there's i guess some more checks and balances but it's uh, it's difficult. You know, so yeah. a lot of times what happens too is this is that is is that that's where maybe a trust protector comes in do you yeah. serve as a what trust is what protector? is a trust protector Oh, that's very good. Uh, a trust protector is someone who quote protects the trust. They can do different things like change uh, things in the trust to comply with changes in law. They can the biggest role usually is to remove and replace trustees. You know things like that. So it's it, that's that's a good idea. I do not serve as trust protector, but if nobody if someone does not have anyone to name, I will put myself in as naming a trust protector for them. I will not serve in any documents under any circumstances. I feel it's a conflict of interest, but okay. um, yeah. So, but you but, will put yourself in as naming a trust protector. If they can't come up with any other, because people yeah. have a hard time coming up with trustees, let alone trust protectors. Yeah, I they usually recommend maybe their CPA or their yeah. fee only financial advisor. Absolutely. Uh, I tend to discourage friends mm -hmm. uh, because they're coming into a family situation and usually friends find it really awkward. CPA is fabulous. I don't know, sometimes the financial advisors can't do it because of the if they're, rules and uh, Yeah, it, that's why I say fee only. Um, you know, okay. somebody who's not a commissioned salesperson. Okay, yeah, but the, yeah, we not that many people put trust protectors in their trust because it's so hard for them to come up with a name and but i'd always put them in irrevocable trust or if somebody has a important a child with special needs i'll put it in there because if the laws change in that arena i want that trust protector to change the laws and i definitely want them to have a trustee at all times and things so i'll put them in for for that but typically not that much um if okay. a child is given up for adoption yeah they're not a child they're not a child of, they're you. not considered a child yeah thank you is that what happened to you don <laughs> <laughs> no i i abandoned my parents <laughs> it's a whole different situation <laughs> they, they moved and didn't tell me where they went i don't know what it meant but they i figured out they moved to laguna I so here i am wrong <laughs> i chased them down so i well well i have your attention um so i have an 11 year old trust and it probably should be updated should i share that with my new attorney or let them think up their own new ideas Oh, uh, I, I think attorneys like to see what your old old documents say, but if I mean, of course they can, well, typically you're going to restate the trust, meaning amend it in its entirety, so you don't have to retitle all the assets. You keep the same name and date and everything. Uh, so you definitely want to provide them with a copy so they can do that. Yeah, um, but the, the, the trust doesn't go out of date. Not with a restatement. No, no, I mean, a trust doesn't, a 20 year old trust, is still valid today as a brand new trust. Right, it's still it's a, valid. You may not have. You, have might, it, um, you want to have it updated if circumstances or the law affects your estate has right. changed. Right. So there's a lot of attorneys who will review your trust and say, "Hey, it's ten years old. Your trustee is still alive. Your beneficiaries are good. There's no need for any changes." The biggest change I see with old trust is the, if you're married, is the AB trust scenario oh. where people don't, that because of tax laws, you had a forced split of the trust. And now you don't need that split for the for that same. You want to talk about that a little bit? I don't know if you have a slide on that or not. I do, but they get kind of crazy back there in the back. Um, I'll tell you, yes, let's go back to, let's go to number 29, 29. The, all, the older trust prior to 2010 all, almost always had an AB split like this. So at the first death, let's say it's $3 million community property estate, and there was a $1.5 million exemption back in 20, 2005, 
you would mandate a split of A and B trust, a revocable A trust, a, a irrevocable B trust, because you, you could pass uh, a million and a half exemption for both spouses only by having that trust. You would lose one exemption if you didn't have that bypass trust holding a million five of the, the deceased spouse's assets. And what um, is the exemption today? 12.06 million. So today, yeah, so today, now today you can leave everything to the surviving spouse. And let me tell you what slide, go to slide 31. Today you can leave everything to the surviving spouse um, and you can port the deceased spouse's exemption to the survivor with a 706 estate tax return. You know, it used to be, you have, if it's just for this sole purpose, it's a two year, you can do it within two years. What does 706 mean? It's the form 706 tax return. It's a state and estate tax return. So it's filed to, to give portability, to port the deceased spouse's exemption to the survivor. Um, and it's also to pay, you know, to when your state's over 12.06 million and you pay the estate tax, so. Does California have an inheritance tax? No, California does not have a state a, an estate tax for some reason. <clears throat> so a married couple could have, what size of an estate today and not pay any estate and gift taxes. Twenty four point, well, I guess it's twenty four point twelve. Yeah, so twenty over twenty four million. Twenty four million can pass free of estate tax. Yeah, so so no worries if you have an estate. And when does that law change? In twenty twenty six, it's going to revert to five million dollars um, adjusted for inflation, so about six million, unless the law is changed or extended in that period of time. So um, yeah, that's how it works. Now let me just tell you an interesting thing like so I have a client who this is this is based on a client of mine they have an eight million dollar estate and her husband died um he died when it was 11.7 million but let's for purposes here she Randy my husband who's his tax attorney is filing a 706 estate tax return to port his exemption to her so if she dies with an eight million dollar estate when it's gone down to six million in the future she won't have to pay any, the kids won't pay any estate tax. So that's why we're reporting it to her um, just so that, that they're, cause they're over 6 million, but they're not, you know, we just, we just have to. So a lot of times people just want to port the exemption while it's so high just to get it, you know, just to have it in the future. Cause okay. they could always drop the exemption lower too. Is lower. there, is there, when someone dies and they're married, they own community property. So they can, each person can create their own trust. And that's what we mean by the A, B, or the survivor and the decedent's trust. Is right. that correct? Right, because what each, what each married person owns is one half of the community property and all their own separate property. You own that at life and you own that at death. And so at, you can, it can go into sub-trusts or not. But it, so, yeah. So the AB trust today is not used for tax purposes. Not for tax. But well, it can be, but it can be because if your state is over 24 million, yeah. you want to use it. So we even so when we do that a when we have everything go to the survivor, if you go to slide 32, you'll see we still put in an, a, a disclaimer trust where the survivor can disclaim assets to a bypass trust if you have a $26 million state. You know, you you can you can disclaim assets up to this deceased spouse's exemption of 12.06 million and have that, it's as though we apply the tax and then, or pay the tax in essence, and then it will go past tax-free to the kids, even if it grows to 50 million by the time of the second spouse's death. If so you all you have an estate over $20 million and you don't see an estate uh -huh. planning attorney you're not doing yourself or your kids uh, a favor. So I, I mean, there's, it's almost a voluntary tax. Yeah. A good estate planning attorney such as Leslie uh, can literally avoid most estate and gift taxes if you give them enough time and they have enough tools in their, in their bag to make sure that you avoid that tax. But what I would like for you to talk a little bit about is there's so many second and third marriages. And mm -hmm. why would you use an AB trust in those circumstances? Well, in those circumstances, it's to provide for the surviving spouse during 
his or her remaining life, but that you have the remainder go to your children from your prior marriage. So sometimes people leave things off the top to kids from prior marriage or do a combination of that with this trust. So the here, here in this slide, um, you would, the survivor share with the one half of the community property and all his or her uh, separate property would go into a revocable survivor's trust. We keep it in a survivor's trust to keep it out of probate, but they can do anything they want, change the beneficiaries. We would have decedents go into, and if let's say if it's, if it's a large estate, we would want to have it go into the B trust to save on taxes. Uh, C trust, anything over the exemption would go into a C trust or a Q-tip trust. These trusts would, provide for the spouse, maybe give them the income that's generated by the assets. And then they would also get distributions for their health, education, maintenance, support to keep them in their custom standard of living. And then the remainder would be locked in to go to the kids from the prior marriage. So that's, that's the way, sometimes we mandate those trusts for that purpose. So the trusts are used to control, control after death, basically. Okay, let's, um, let's talk a little bit about, so, if, First of all, AB trust most of the time is used for second marriages, making sure that the children of the different marriages make sure that they get their inheritance. A, yeah, AB or AC or ABC, because yeah. if it's a large estate, we want to use the B trust for saving on taxes, but, yes. but because this gets complicated, I don't want to go too far, far afield on this, but yeah. as it's the pass from when the first spouse dies, the community property gets a full step up in cost basis. And you talked about this in a prior uh, session, I believe. When you when the second spouse dies, there's no step up from the B trust. But we did we have not discussed step up in basis. Okay. So I don't you, know if you have a slide on that. I but I do have a slide. It's a real it's a real minimalist type slide. But basically um, if you have let me try to find it. I don't remember where I put it. It's called um if you have um if you buy a house let's go for a stock okay if you buy stock let's say you have a stock that you bought for uh, twenty dollars and it would happen to be apple and <laughs> now it's worth uh uh twenty thousand dollars yeah so anyway but if you if you sell it you're going to pay capital gain on the spread there and you know it's going to be what 30 between 35 and 40 so yes. um, oh here it is i know why i called it i called it step up or step down because nobody talks about step down but there is it can be step up or step down um but there's another slide with the numbers in it but anyway uh but when you die when you inherit a death it gets a full step up in basis to the fair market value so it's twenty thousand. if you go if you turn around and sell it after you inherit it there's no capital gain because yeah. if stepped up basis so it's that's why i like people i don't like parents to do the do it yourself put the kid on title and things like that on their house because or give it to them right before they die because they now the kid got their original basis of a hundred thousand on the house that's worth now worth a million if they sell it there's a nine hundred thousand dollar spread to pay taxes on yeah. um but if they got inherited at death and it was worth a million they could sell it the next day and have no capital gain so that's what we're talking about and yeah, we just had an individual die just uh, last week, and we knew three or four days before that that he was planning on dying. And so since there was some opportunity to do some tax planning because of the pan uh, because of the Ukraine war, the some of his stock went uh, down in value, we used a step down. That's theory fun. and sold those stocks that had lost value so we can use that as a loss so that they wouldn't get a step down in cost basis yeah, it's, yes you yeah. know it's uh so step up and step down is an important concept and that's another reason why you want to know your cost basis and your market value of your assets right right and community property is so important because that gives you a full adjustment on the first death. Right. That's why when we get, most people we find when we have their deed, we see it's joint tenancy. We always transmute it when, well, always, but we typically transmute it to community property on the face of the deed when we transfer it to the trust, just to make sure. 
Yeah. yeah. Is, is, is all property that is in a married couple's trust assumed to be uh, community property? Not necessarily. I mean, if you inherit a house and it's in your sole name, it's it, it, everything that goes in the trust retains its character. And you can, so when we transfer that house and it still re remains separate property. But it has to be listed as such. It does, it does. If it doesn't list it, how it's titled, it's going to be assumed to be community yeah, property. Yeah, because like a bank account is very hard to keep separate. If you're both on title as trustee, there's, unless the bank will, it's going to be very hard to keep that separate. Yeah, yeah. But, a, but a house you can. Yeah. Let's talk a little bit about death. And money's going to children. Uh, I know, Don, you're going to have a question. Don's going to have a question. It wouldn't have appeared all of a sudden. <laughs> Is it possible in my in my revocable trust, my living trust, to specify that after my death, this these assets go to my children, but in 50 years, whatever's left goes to a, to a charity? Yeah, you can do anything. I mean... You can, yeah. Well, the first question is, would there be any money left or would the kids figure that out <laughs> and spend the heck out of it? My suggestion would have been set up an irrevocable trust, yeah. a, a crud or something else that says they get income from it and then at the end it goes. Typically, you'd set up a charitable trust, yeah. Right. Yeah. Let, but we're going to go, my question is right along the same lines as Don. Oh, yeah. And Thank that you. is, is that are, are you giving your monies outright to your kids, Leslie, I'm or not. should people look at giving their monies in trust to their children or to their beneficiaries and talk a little bit about the pros and cons of that? This is slide 37. Um, so a lot of, some people wanna give things outright to their children. Um, some people wanna give things at ages or stages like distributions for health, education, maintenance, sport, and then half, you know, one third at 25, a, remain, a half at 30 and the remainder at 35. I have mine going to my kids in lifetime trusts for, uh, but letting them serve as trustee. Um, you can name a distribution trustee if you really want super asset protection, you never name the child trustee, you put a third party in charge, you have a trust protector who moves and replaces, that would protect them from creditors, but then they are not serving as trustee. I, I have mine where the, it's a beneficiary control trust. Uh, the way we try to build an asset protection is say that if the descendant resigns as trustee, they appoint a third party, try to put a barrier between them and creditors. You know, what it does is it lets them inherit in trust. So it keeps it separate from their spouse in case of divorce. It makes it easier to keep it separate from their spouse. If they leave anything in the trust, it goes down to their kids. It's a built in estate plan for that inheritance. So you can leave monies to your children and enhance spousal protection and enhance creditor protection, which yeah, they can't do for themselves if you leave it to them outright. Right, that's correct. So, okay. um, and then um, one more point, there's also, you know, there's still a parent child and parent grandchild property tax exclusion on the principal residence, there's a credit. Um, so that is something that you have to remember to file on the personal residence when it goes to you, if you plan to live there within the next year after your parents parents pass so, but I, so so and with a dollar I, amount limit it's a, you get a million dollar credit yeah now, welcome should, to laguna beach i know i know <laughs> back on the ballot they changed back to the old law which is so nice yeah so we'll <laughs> we'll see i know they're working on it people are working on it yeah we'll so that. lifetime benefit trusts um uh are becoming more popular yeah. And um, because of the fact it gives some creditor protection yep. and spousal protection, there's so many marriages that are, you know, that yeah. I end up in divorce. Um, but there's also sometimes the kids need protection. So yeah. then they wouldn't one of them is a special needs trust. What well, is you, that? Here uh, in all my trusts, I have a backup supplemental or special needs trust for people who are, um, receiving needs-based government benefits or they were or applying for them that this their inheritance might blow that so they they we have their inheritance going to the special needs trust to supplement those benefits so they still get them but they have the trust to hold their inheritance so that works really really well and and we also have backup trust for people who if some people want to give things outright and you can't talk them out of it and that's fine it's their, their choice but we still have the backup trust for someone who's incapacitated or underage so the trustee if they find somebody has we've had this people have gone mentally ill or something between the time they've created the trust and they inherited 
they can put it in the trust and oversee it for them, things like that. Yeah. And there's also some people create pet trusts for their pets, and some pets have some of these. Yeah. I, well, yeah. like the house I've had a pet them. trust. Uh, <laughs> uh, there's also, you know, if you have a spendthrift uh, child or you have a, you know, uh, you can create a trust pretty much unique to benefit your children, whatever you think is best. Right. Um, let's go through uh, if, oh, if you're an immigrant or one of you is a non-U.S. citizen, please do a special type of trust. Oh, We're not going to go into it, but your attorney needs to know whether absolutely. or not you're a citizen. Absolutely. Um, let's talk. Uh, we've got about three minutes left. Don, you want to come back on the screen? And do we have no. any questions that... <laughs> Uh, <laughs> stop sharing. <laughs> yeah. Well, you just answered the one. Um, where and Pete's here. No, Trevor is here. Trevor is. Pete's here too. <laughs> what do you know? I've been here. I've just been. I know you've been quiet in the background. <laughs> yeah, I've been checking in on you guys. Make you sure you get extra points for having shown up on camera. Uh, basically, <laughs> we've asked them. Um, other than, um, I if them. I have a private trustee and a corporate trustee, and I outlive them, what should I do? If you have a what? If I have a private fiduciary or a corporate trustee and I outlive them, what should I do? I don't know how you can outlive a corporate trustee because yeah, new ones. <laughs> well, unless the bank was sold or something happened to the bank, but yeah, well, I you, agree. You, you name a new trust, but one of the reasons, like I like people to name, you know, if they're naming people, I'd like to, them to name private fiduciary and a corporate trustee as a final backstop because then they're never going to run out because corporate. It, the corporate trustee will always have somebody there, but um, yeah, they should just name and change their estate plan and name new people. Yeah, but 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 corporations have perpetual existence, so they're not. Now. They, corporations do not die. Yeah, they only don't. people do. Yeah, they'll but have they probably else. do not do powers of attorney or advanced health care directives. No, they. No, they they're not personal. Not definitely not advanced healthcare directive. Right. And some of them will do powers attorney for so the most do, don't like I like, it. I like private fiduciaries better for that. And and we're using private fiduciaries more and more because there's a lot of people out there don't have responsible family members. They're the last person standing. They have a lot of a lot of reasons to use them. Yeah. yeah. We'd recommend that you that you go to an estate planning attorney if you're going to use a private professional because they have worked with people uh, such as us, as Trevor and I, who are professional fiduciaries, but contact your attorney. They, they know the people that they work with and uh, know best. Leslie, will you take phone calls or emails from people after the session if they have a question or two? Sure, I prefer email. And yes. if you have to talk about it, email me and say you want to talk to me because I have to, we have to schedule it. Otherwise I'd be, I can't fit yeah. into my email the best time between meetings or phone calls and things. Yeah. And by the way, only thing that an attorney has is their expertise and time. So time is absolutely valuable. So uh, for uh, Leslie, even to, uh, by the way, she volunteers with the Laguna Beach seniors and uh, is the, uh, is the Suzy Q open now or is it uh, Do still closed? On the phone. Uh, is <laughs> on it the open? Phone so yes, it is. Yeah. 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 Okay. She yeah. volunteers over there for uh, um, a couple hours, I think, every other week. Yeah, um, and uh, But she's willing to take emails and answer any of your questions. Mm -hmm. um, Trevor, you haven't said much. Uh, any comments? No, no, it's okay. a good job. I mean, a lot of information. And, um, but, you know, the, the, I think you guys did a great job. Yeah. Leslie is one of our favorites. Um, yeah, no, it's, it's, it's been um, very good. Good job, Leslie. So I'm going to say this has been Financial Estate Literacy. It's your estate. Week three, wills and trusts. Next week, we're going to talk about um, retirement accounts, which are critically important to you in terms of for you and for heirs or anyone else, and a lot of issues relating to that. So that's a very critical thing. Pete, do you want to say anything else in wrap up? Uh, no, it's just uh, retirement plans are very complicated. And most estate planning attorneys do not know enough about them. And so Michael Simon will be uh, speaking on it. And I think 
you'll enjoy. He actually makes it enjoyable understanding the IRS code. So uh, mm -hmm. I, I want to thank Leslie again. And uh, uh, she has two. Do you still have your office in Irvine? I have it. I don't go there, though. I okay. Right. Okay. So her office is located right here in Laguna Beach. And uh, we really appreciate the time and effort that she took today to uh, present. And Don, Trevor, we'll see you next week. Have a good time. Thank you very much. Bye. -bye. Bye.